Felix here, and good morning to you. Is this the beginning of a real stock market rally? Well, let's look at the data. Let's look at what's driving this market, why we flipped last week from being horribly depressed to now being exuberantly optimistic. It's important to understand the fundamentals that drive this. And of course, I'll take your questions. This is a live one. So put them in the live chat and we'll get that. Also, Last warning, you want to know how we make a bucket load of money trading one stock, no emotions, completely rule-based. You set up the trade, you can basically forget about it because we've automated every possibility from profits to um, risk management. Then come and join me tomorrow. I'll teach you that. FelixRentsDog slash webinar. We literally have, um, we allow 500 people to sign up. So we have, uh, what is that, 65 spots available? That'll go very, very quickly. <laughs> so, what's changed last week to kick off this sudden rally? That's the first thing we want to look at. And I'll take you through the key data points here that come from the desks of companies like Goldman Sachs and, and, and others. So, the financial condition index, you might be thinking, the what? Well, the financial condition index is a thing that Goldman Sachs tracks, and it went down pretty sharply uh, last week. But it has, of course, gone up a lot. Why am I using a red arrow for that? Because tighter financial conditions mean it's worse for the economy. It's worse for stocks, generally speaking. And the Fed hasn't done anything since July. They didn't do anything in the meeting last week. But these tighter financial conditions are basically the same thing as three interest rate hikes, 75 basis points. And that's really dragging and slowing down the US economy. So this is um, Papa Powell, Reserve Chair, Federal Reserve Chair, Jerome Powell rather. And he said, look, what I can say is that financial conditions have clearly tightened. And that's new. That wasn't in the previous speeches. I know it's a very exciting life where we analyze every word of some ex well, what was he? he was really a banker, wasn't he? Private equity guy. You can see that in the rates that consumers and households and businesses are paying now over time, that'll have an effect. We just don't know how persistent it's going to be. And it's tough to try to translate that in a way that I'd be comfortable communicating into how many rate cuts that is. Well, I can tell you, it's three rate hikes, three rate hikes. That's what that is. So the market then went, ah, he's realized that that's already done three rate hikes. Therefore, he's done. He doesn't need to do anymore. Right? We also had glorious earnings ad. We had Amazon come in with a 10 billion profit. We had Microsoft come in with 22 billion profit and higher margins. We had Meta come in with 11 billion and higher margins. So the big ones, the big boys delivered and therefore took away the fear of, well, what if the Magnificent Seven all falter, right? You look at the S&P 500, we are above the key moving averages again. We're above the uptrend since October. Let me let me show you what that looks like on a chart. So what are the moving averages? This down here was the 200 day moving average. And be below that, as I say, always say, nothing good happens. We're even above the 50 day moving average, which is, sits at about 4,350. And if you go back to last October, when this rally kind of got kicked off, and you connect your points, well, we're, 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 we're back in the clear, right? I'm collecting that one there, this one here, and, and that one here, and I'm, I'm calling this an outline, which is what happens. So we're back, no matter how you draw the line, in the clear. And that's positive. That helps. However, there is always a but, isn't there? It's a large, large but. And... It isn't on Ozempic yet. And that's this. U.S. Treasury yields, this is getting sexy, and the S&P, next year's P.E. ratio in reverse. You're like, Felix, okay, this chart's a bit much. All right, let's go to a simpler one. Doomberg has dumped this down for us a little bit, which is helpful. I appreciate them making a simpler chart than the bankers. Bankers get carried away sometimes. They live in their own little world. I used to make charts for morning meetings and, and for the sales guys, and you get carried away sometimes as to that person. So what have you got here? You've got in blue the 10-year 
treasury yield. So basically the interest rate in a sense of or the, what you're getting for owning t US 10 years. And then in black, you've got very simply the S&P as we live and love it. And you can see, well, I'll zoom in for it for you, but that there is a pretty sizable gap between this. So mind the gap for you Londoners. And that gap needs filling. And how does that gap get, get filled? Well, in an ideal world, yields will come down and meet the S&P. Because that way the S&P can go up. But if yields stay up there, well, it's not really ideal, is it? <laughs> so yields have to basically come down. Um, otherwise, this, this doesn't, really, doesn't really work. So if yields stay this high, money gets sucked into the bond markets, right? So you'd have to you'd kind of think it, it would have to turn around. Uh, and that's a, that's a risk here that we need to, need to understand. So is it, is it time to, to party? Well, it's certainly time to smash the like button, which 250 of you have so far neglected to do, but I know you just forgot, so I've just reminded you. So it's an easy, an easy task. And you might, you know, burn an extra calorie or two. Who knows? U.S. sales, this is a Bloomberg chart, that's, sales is a, is a simple word for revenue, are the weakest in four years. So less than half, in fact, it's 48.3% of all S&P 500 firms have beaten their revenue estimates. A half happened. And that's not glorious. So this is where we're at. So usually we beat, usually we exceed. Now, but that was a simple chart. This is, this is the advanced chart. This is the this is the investment banker chart. And here you can see that this is this current quarter, the last bar here on the right. This is beat, and that's less than 10%. The unchanged, I don't think I have a shit color, excuse my French, um, that's no change. So that's just like as expected, basically. And then in red up there at the top, you've got below, or rather, you know, revenue guidance adjustment. So guidance lower. So that's a little on the shocking side, isn't it? And that's lower than at any point since this is 2015. So there were some nasty years in there, 2015, 16, 19 wasn't brilliant. Um, 18, 19 wasn't brilliant for, you know, obvious reasons. So that kind of tells a story. Now, you might be thinking, okay, Felix, you told us revenue, show me profit, because that's the chart that's going to knock my friend's socks off. And, uh, you know, your girlfriend is going to be impressed by this one. And it's the same story, isn't it? You've got very, very little upwards revisions, about 15% of companies revising their earnings for next quarter up. You've got the um, the brownish color, which is unchanged, mostly unchanged, no change. And then you've got a big cohort up here of 50%, do we have a red pen? 50% downgrades in, in expectations. So that's, you know, just something to bear in mind as we're exuberant here this morning, that there is something under the hood that is making strange noises. And yes, you can keep pressing your foot on the accelerator and it'll be all right for a while, but at some point, the wheel might come off. Um, daylight saving time. Oh yeah, that's happening again, isn't it? I don't know where that's happening, but um, th there we are. So what is important to understand though is that these profits revisions, these EPS profit revisions are not happening equally across sectors. So basically your, your tech and your consumer stocks are doing marvelously. And then you've got your materials, your real estate, your REITs, your healthcare, you're doing really, really poorly. So it, arguably, this is the contrarian buy because they are already in the, you know, in the hole and digging. So that is something to perhaps look at if you're looking at investing some money, not, not a recommendation. Now, it is still lots of good news, lots of good news. I, I don't try to 
calm you, you know, put you into a depressive kind of state here this morning. Equity positions. What the heck's this? Basically, the funds, we know how long or short they are. And they are at the moment at this level here, which if I draw a line across it, is fairly low. So their, their exposure to stocks is pretty low. What does that mean? It means they can buy a heck of a lot more. They could buy a lot more than what they're doing right now. 31 percentiles where we are right now. So they could go, you know, up a lot. So what actually happens next? Well, there are a couple of things you want to look at here on the lovely stock chart that I've screenshotted. One is this down here, 4250, was the 200-day moving average line. And that's important that we're above that. Below that, it was bad. And um, what was that film from? That stuttering. Someone, something, isn't it? Somebody knows. Tell me. That yellow line there at essentially 4,350 is the 50-day moving average line. You want to be above that. And then you get resistance coming up. Still can't find sufficiently weird maroon color to match that color up there. And that sits at 4,400. That's the 150-day moving average line. So those are lines I keep an eye on. And so to get through 4,400 is the harder part. What we've done so far was kind of the easy bit. And then the next resistance up here sits at these levels up here, where these peaks are, where, which is sort of 4,500, give, give or take a little bit. Can we have a straight line there? There we go. Now, you could be smarter about this and, and actually look up positioning. How do you do that? Well, 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 you open a clever little tool called optionswatch.io. Um, it's a free tool. There's a free trial version as well. And you can type in SPX, which is the S&P 500. You click on the S&P 500. And what do you see here? What's going on here? What happened to our expirations? Very strange. Very strange. Interesting. Okay. Um, that's a topic of another conversation. But what you can see here is the following. These little green bars are where the call options are. And the little red bars is where the put options are. You might be thinking, what does that mean? Well, where all the green bars are, that's your resistance on the way up. And you can see it sits just above 4,400. So you can move a call to there and click on it. And then it shows you what that is. But what's going on here with our SPX data this morning? A bit weird. Okay, something a bit funky going on there. But yes, it's just about 4,400 for November. For December, it sits at 4,400. You can see that here too. That's, again, where the resistance lies on the way up. So it's quite useful to see that. And that'll be, make it harder to break through. So again, you could you could um, put a line in here and say 4,400 hard. You know, that's sort of a thing to look at. Now, if you look at our techie friends, our NASDAQ friends, uh, what, what, what do you see here? Well, you see a slightly more optimistic story. Why? Because more big tech in there, more Microsoft and so on. We've broke, you know, we never hit the 200-day moving average. So that was good. You know, that's a smiley. We're above the 50-day the and we're above the 150-day or around about the 150-day. So it's actually much better. Okay, you have resistance up here, which would be sort of 15,300 or something, and then a fair bit up there. I don't know, 15,500, something like that. And, and, and that's, a, that's a thing. But fundamentally, we have... gotten rid of the curse of the downward trend? That's, I guess, the question. You want to really break out of this downward trend? You want to head for the, like, what's the 15,300 up here, that yellow line there? And, and then, you know, you're ready for Christmas, basically. If you have questions, put them in the live chat down below. That's what we do this live for. If you haven't already signed up for tomorrow, it's literally less than 24 hours. Rule-based trading. No emotions, just rules, really. For entry, for exit, it's all rules. It's all rules. 
sign up at felixfriends.org slash webinars, claim one of the last 65 spots we have here. We take 500 people on these because that way I can still answer your questions and everything else. So that's where we are this morning. And futures, greenish, but that's all we need. We just needed to hold. This is pre-market, Apple coming down a little bit, which is nice. That's the only bearish trade I've got on. And I'm not recommending that, but that's where we are at. Ernie is asking about short selling in South Korea. Yeah, it's a funny one. So they've unexpectedly just banned short selling, which I think the last time that was floated was under Obama, who I think had the smartness to realize that that doesn't really solve very much. But it, it, South Korea is basically alleging lots of naked shorts happening and some people are manipulating the market. It's not the biggest stock market in the world, so it's probably not that deep, so it's maybe easier to do. So I'm not saying that they're, they're wrong, but it's a pretty odd move. So the market is just taken off and then some. Uh, makes you wonder whether it was hedge funds who knew this was coming and positioned themselves rightly. I, I I don't know. Or maybe everybody who was short was just like, bloody hell, we better cover our positions. And that's why the Korean stock market is up. So if you look at the Cosby composite index, it's up 5.6% today, which is a pretty unusual for an index. Um, and it's been, been see, somebody knew, right? Look at that, that gap, and then this gap up. So I think somebody knew about this last week. That's probably the way things work uh, in Korea. Bad to the bone. Um, <laughs> I love that. How does it affect companies in the US like Samsung? Yeah, Samsung is Samsung is essentially it's a, it's a Korean company um, and is about something like 30% of the stock market or something in Korea, which is just insane. So is that, they have a US listing, Samsung? I never, never looked. Um, there are loads of Samsungs. It's probably Samsung Electric is what you're looking at. I remember doing a chart of all the Samsung companies, and it's like hundreds, unbelievable. But how they all they're woven. They all own parts of each other, and it's one way that they prevent anybody from ever taking over their their businesses. It's virtually impossible. It's so bloody complex the structure. It took me about two weeks to put that together. So. Any questions here about, other than about daylight um, savings time? I don't know. That seems to have happened in the US. What does that mean? What is it? Is it earlier? Is it later? Who knows? No. So something up 10% last week. Looks about right. 5% on this chart. But maybe that was another Samsung. Any other questions, chaps? Uh, smash the like button. Otherwise, uh, that always helps. You can have a look at Bloomberg's lovely headline. Stocks hold gains after big rally on Fed rates. That's just kind of true. I think you need to start your day. War risk premium and oil options market is virtually gone. Yep, no, no one cares about the war anymore. Israel's latest. Military says Hamas commanders killed in attacks. Um, hopefully they do kill some of the right people. Um, everyone's pro-war at the moment, right? Is that is that the sentiment? It seems to be, right? Just generally. Like, it doesn't really matter what war. Anyway. Do you think the short squeeze will happen from your Sunday video, Lost in BKK? I think the the most shorted stocks out there, which are typically your, your high-risk tech stocks, right? Is there a most shorted basket on, on here? I don't know if we've got an index for that. Well, we have it for cryptos, but not for stocks. But yeah, there is a, I think it's Goldman who uh, tracks a most shorted. No. No, there isn't. But yeah, so that, but essentially, you know, that your sort of arc type stuff has the potential to to really move up a lot, I think. I don't know what the short interest is on this at the moment, but the underlying, a lot of the stuff is pretty pretty shorted. So if you see a significant, very quick rally up, people who are short are suddenly facing some serious pain. 
technically everything changes and it went from, you know, look at look at this little indicator down here. The red bars are cell signals. And then completely unexpectedly after 10 days of red, we, we get the jobs data and the Fed sort of change in position and the market blows blows a casket. So uh, people, this, this, this stock's up $7. That's, that's a lot. You know, 20% up. And what we were seeing on Friday was stuff like DraftKings up 16%, um, you know, Expedia up 18%, all, all that kind of thing. That's squeeze potential. So the those kind of stocks, yes, I think it's quite, quite possible. What one source do you generally use for news, says Nathan? I think, I think the one is the problem. There's, there's no perfect news source. Bloomberg for, I mean, I do dig it, but they do do a reasonable job. Uh, don't read all the misery. Just read the markets thing. They put out a thing in the morning, which is a reasonable. And um, so, yeah, I think it's probably still one of the better commercial sources out there. And then I, I, I dive through a bunch of other random bits, which sometimes are interesting, sometimes are not. And I get emails pinged over and the guys and the team share me things and stuff. So it's kind of like a mishmash of of sources. Farouk saying, do you think Palantir can break the $20 resistance line? Well, let's have a look, shall we? And we're at 1889. $20 is the core cool wall. That's right. And also that that peak there at the top. Well, I think at the moment, really, what I would be looking more for is consolidation. Like what we don't want to happen is, you know, this sort of thing, which is what happens quite a lot when we get these rallies up, right? We get a bit of optimism, a bit of rally up, like we did it here. And then we come come down. So you just want to, you would just want to hold it. It'd be lovely to hold it above 19, of course, but I'd be less concerned about that. And you just need the market broadly to move. I think that's really what it's about. Because what, what news are we getting on Palantir this week? Okay, you might get an NHS contract or something like that. Okay, that would be that would be a, a catalyst, but we don't have something that we, we know about that's coming because earnings are just behind us. How's M2 looking? That's money, by the way. M2 economy. M2, M2. The moving average lines. Coming down a bit. Coming down a bit. About a trillion dollars down. I, I look more at the balance sheet. Uh, U.S. That's the one. U.S. C. B. B. S. That's more what I look at, because that's the Fed's balance sheet, and that's now down from about nine trillion to about seven point eight trillion, and that's that's not good, right? So the more that comes down, the more that hurts the stock market, and this is tightening that we don't really see, but it's 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 definitely happening. Larry says, I've got lots more time. I appreciate that. So yeah, so, so you guys move time now, have you? Time, New York. Oh, it's 8.30 a.m. now. Okay, okay, I get it. Yeah, I don't know. We might we might, might keep this time, but maybe that's why a few of you showed up a little little late. I appreciate that. Thank you. I think my time's... I think we changed times here too. I'm in Hong Kong at the moment. Hong Kong, winter time change. Do we do that in here? No. They haven't done it since 1979. <laughs> I really paid attention. Uh, so, okay, that's good. I won't get confused. In Google, you can do London versus New York. Shows you both. Uh, thank you very much. You got to stay up later for trading. Yes, that's true. That's true. Um, not super ideal, is it? Or earlier. No, earlier it's not sucks. Yeah, get to do it later. Well, we'll we've we've done it many a times, many a winter, and um the sunshine here definitely is worth it. Can you explain why core put walls represent support and resistance, says Michael? You sure you want me to do that? Okay, let me let me explain it to you. I've I've, I've done it a few times, but it's a it's a very useful thing to to understand. Okay, so let's let's do a core wall because it's easier. So a core wall, what is it? Where 
the largest number of calls are positioned. Now, you have to understand how it works. So say, you must have asked Michael. Okay, say Michael buys a call option. What happens? A market maker sells michael.call. Now, market makers are people who are like on the trading floor and they basically provide the liquidity in the market. We've got two of them on our coaching team, so we've got a pretty good insight of, of how that works and they, well, they make the market. So what does that mean? Well, you have to understand that market makers take zero risk. They don't care whether the stock goes up or down or, you know, round and round and round she goes. So what do they do? Well, what happened here in this example, the market maker is effectively now minus 100 shares in this position. So say you buy a call option on, on Palantir, for, for, for example, right? So the market maker sells that call to you. So the market maker effectively is short a call option because he sold it. He's minus a call option, which means he is effectively exposed as if he had sold 100 shares of Palantir. And he doesn't want that because what if Palantir stock goes up? He's going to lose money. So what does he do? The market maker, let's call him the MM, sells, sorry, buys 100 shares of PLTR at the same time he sold Michael, and asked this question very nicely, the call option. So he's effectively, he now owns 100 shares of Palantir, plus he sold you that call option, so he's he's back at zero. Zero risk exposure. He just made money on the, on the margin for you on the bid-ask spread. Now, what happens when Palantir goes up? Michael makes money with his call option and sells the call option to realize the profit, right? Now, what does our little, little market maker friend therefore do? the market maker gets back the call option. He buys it back. So the market maker buys the call and now has 100 shares of Palantir without the short call to get him to you know, this sort of neutral position that he likes to be in. So what does he therefore do? He sells 100 shares of Palantir. So what happens is that as call options start to make money because the share price went up, the market makers sell the, the stock. And that's what creates the resistance. So if you look at this lovely Palantir chart we were at here just now. Why are we in a month chart? It's like on a day chart. Where we have that call wall here, 20. You get to 20, the market maker starts selling. Doesn't mean you can't break through 20, but it's just harder because there are people selling. So when you take profits on a call option, you actually depress the market. I mean, you are a tiny, you know, insect in the, in the universe of, of, of the stock market, but that's essentially how, how it works. So I hope that explains it. I hope that didn't bore you guys uh, stiff. Uh, if you want to take a screenshot of that, do, because it's a little bit counterintuitive. I get that. And if you want to really understand this, write it out yourself for a put option. Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a challenge. 60,000 subscribers lost in the last three minutes. <laughs> that's how the market works, though. So... And Stephen um, loved that question, and Stephen is one of my mentees. 
Uh, yes, you are, of course, right that if you want to get this precisely right, you need to look at the deltas to figure out what the delta is and, 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 and so on. And that way you find the exact position because they're delta neutral. And they don't actually, it's not 100 shares that they buy or sell. It might be a slightly lesser amount uh, or slightly greater amount. So yeah, you're completely right. Um, Larry, you want to move to Hong Kong? No time change. Yeah, so 1979. So the, we can thank the um, colonial Brits for that. They haven't figured out in London yet. Felix telling us, insight makes me feel bad. Um, okay, I don't know what that means. So, um, I'll sell out of my stocks now. You give up, right? It's just, it's just complicated. Who needs to understand this? You don't need to understand this, but you ask the question. I mean, blame Michael. Should, we should all uh, blame Michael in the chat here. Uh, now, I'd love to say the market's open now, but apparently uh, some idiot came up with the idea of introducing winter time. Therefore, we don't know what the hell is happening for another hour. And um, I'm going to go out and I'm going to get myself some dessert. I've got a hot date and therefore I'm going I'm going out and the market will have to um to wait but look at the pre-market here everything is pretty much flat right so that's all we want from today we just want the market not to drop and drop the gains from Friday Apple is the thing that still worries me that's what I was talking about last week because where Apple goes the market goes and we do have a bearish trade on Apple sitting at 185 so we make money if Apple goes up or if Apple goes down. And that's a little bit of a risky one. I totally get that. I did that intentionally. And this is sort of, you know, where we're at. So at the moment, we're below the trend line. We're kind of still bearish on Apple. Um, we are, see that yellow line there? That's the 50 day that sits at about 176, 77. So for my trade to work, I just want Apple to go sideways, and I'm very, very happy. Uh, Michael, okay, brilliant. <laughs> Glad you stopped and you read your how to And yet, this stuff is a little bit of a mind bent. I mean, when people first explained this to me, I was just like, huh? Uh, that was my, my reaction. What do you think about LLY, Peter? I did a I did a couple of videos on 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 fat drugs or you know, obesity drugs, whatever you want to call them. And um uh, I, yeah, I think LLY and, and Novo are the ones to beat. I think they both potentially have a yeah, tremendous opportunity. Tremendous opportunity. Uh, it's just much easier than going to the gym, isn't it? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I like them both. Now, they're, they're not super cheap at the moment, obviously, but they have got a, some serious pipeline. I did a video on that the other day, and, and so, so, so look it up. If you type in, um, does it come up? You type in LLY Felix or something. I don't know. Sometimes I think these things come up and then obviously they don't. LLY Felix. Yeah, here we go. This one. Next 10x stocks. Um, if you watch that from two weeks ago, the green thumbnail hill, just type in LLY and Felix, then um, you, you get my, my breakdown on that, on, on those companies. Pick of the date or we ain't buying the hot part. Well, what if it's a golden retriever? <laughs> um, thank you, Felix. You've got no boat. Yeah, me, me too. Me too. Are you going to change the start time for live chats, um, says Stephen? Don't know. I'll I'll let you know. We've been we've been here before, right? We used to do we used to do 8:30 starts and then we went to 9:30, probably because some mup had changed the time zone. And and now we're back to 8:30. So for the moment, I think we'll we'll stay here. Uh, as we are a little pricey, Novo. Yes, and I think I think that's true. It's come down a touch, hasn't it, Novo? Are we on the economy? Mm, Novo. Novo Nordisk, which is now the size. It's NVO, isn't it? That's it. It's uh, now the size of the Danish economy or something. Uh, I was going to say something ruder there, but it's, yeah, it's still, it's still holding up very nicely above the 50-day. So... Yeah, it's not cheap. It is just isn't. Um, you can't argue with that. But it's potentially got a pretty tremendous opportunity. It's 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 them in, in LY. I think everyone else is way behind the the curve. <laughs> Get it? Uh, so 
how it works well for you. Okay, brilliant. I appreciate you uh, watching, um, Peter. Thanks very much for finding the channel and staying. Uh, smash the, the like button. It helps to spread this video further. I'm a little bit mood lit today because my, my light broke. So I put up a... Um, yeah, we're, we're a little bit dark today. I've got a special companion here. He wants to say good evening. Do you mind, Scoopy? There we go. This is a, one of the, the rarer breeds we've got in this house called Squeaks, because she squeaks when she lands. Anyway, she's not very uh, not very uh, happy to be picked up, really, but uh, she's giving me a rather dirty look. So, Paul, um, link to my portfolio. Uh, crikey, that's in the... That's in the um, the community somewhere. I need to find that. Another bunch of rules-based trading. Absolutely. It's just set it up, forget about it. That's really what it's all about. Uh, and then all scenarios are taken care of. So if you want to learn that, come and join me, Felix Fensalak slash webinar. Uh, so we set up a trade based on rules. We then set up a tiered profit-taking approach to kind of maximize our profits and minimize our risk. We set up stop losses. We can set up trailing stops as well. So if something is just really not nicely running, we're always slightly behind it with our risk ma management to just make sure everything is taken care of and no emotion gets in the way of you making money and preserving your capital, which is what it's all about. Aircon fixed. Yes, uh, a, a, a little chap showed up today and knocked on the door and uh, was on the ladder and told me off about having the window open when I have the aircon on. So apparently I'm to blame for this. Like button pressing gives you endorphins. Try it, says Larry. Uh, love that. Thank you. And appreciate you watching and tuning in. I wish you a glorious day. All we want today is a flat day. If, if that's what we get, we should be, it, it's a good one. And I hope to see you live tomorrow, probably at the same new time if you are, if you are in, in somewhere where they mess with your time zone and your, your head, generally speaking. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow.